Uh, the Pitt County Board of Education meeting regular uh, session, um, October the 6th, 2014. And so we are in open session, and uh, everyone's here except for Robert Moore. So we do have a quorum. And if we could have Jennifer sure. and do the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would like to, uh, we're grateful that we had a, a good opening of the school year and that uh, our kids have been safe and we continue to want to pray for our kids to be safe and that uh, our parents and families are supportive of our students and also that our staff uh, is, is safe and you know in this day and time we have to look at safety and I think we're doing a good job in our school system regarding that and we just want to continue to pray for it and let's have a moment of silence. Amen. All right. Uh, routine business. Is there adjustment to the agenda? Mr. Chairman, I would uh, ask that under educational programs and services, we add a item number one under A to include uh, first reading on the revisions, uh, revision to policy 10.111 previously discussed in the EPS committee meeting. So are you making that motion? Yes, sir. All right. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Sean seconded. Any discussion? Aye. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. We are just added that to the uh, agenda. Now, are there any more adjustments to the agenda? A motion to approve the agenda, agenda as revised. Make so move. Ms. Council made a motion. A second. Second. Mark seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, pass. Public expression. We have uh, Jenny Bryan is going to speak on South Central High School Education Engagement Project. We've got three minutes. Good evening. I'm Jenny Bryan from South Central High School. I'm a social studies teacher and I'm here to issue you all a save the date for November 17th through 21st. That is American Education Week. And uh, once again, South Central High School is hosting the Education Engagement Project. Um, a special thank you to those of you who were able to participate with us last year, Dr. Leaker, Ms. Little, Ms. Williams, Ms. Kamnitz, and Ms. Council for coming out um, and, and visiting with us at South Central High School. Uh, the Education Engagement Project's purpose is to invite community leaders and members into our teacher's classroom for a full day's activity to partner with that teacher in lesson planning, in classroom management, um, and other teachers' daily responsibilities. Um, we see the Education Engagement Project as an opportunity um, for you all to collaborate with us to gain insight into our successes as well as our challenges, um, to build upon the already positive relationships we have, and uh, to, to leave uh, being a, a little more informed about um, the di or, or being able to have a more informed dialogue about the daily activities of our students and our teachers. And um, I will be visiting with our county commissioners and some folks with our Pitt County Educational Foundation and inviting them. But I wanted to take the opportunity to invite you all to, say, again, save the date, mark your calendars. Be checking your email in the coming days, um, and as, as I will be sending a more formal email invitation, um, and ask that you would RSVP so that we could be adequately prepared to host you um, for a day that week. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, spotlight on teaching and uh, learning, uh, Robin Wright and Brock. Good evening. Before I uh, ask Dr. Wright to come up, I want to just fill you in on a couple things. We had uh, another spotlight tonight that uh, we had to move due to the person having another obligation. It's a really good one. I look forward to bringing that to you hopefully next month. 
Um, also, I want to remind all of you about the Principal of the Year ceremony that's coming up this Thursday night. Hopefully, as many of you as possible can join us for that. Uh, it's 6 o'clock at Rock Springs Center on Thursday evening. Uh, and now I'm going to ask uh, if Dr. Robin Wright uh, could come up and speak a little bit about the Exceptional Children's Teacher of Excellence Award that was recently given to one of our employees, uh, Dr. Wright. Good evening. I am excited to be before you today to recognize one of our Exceptional Children's Teachers. The North Carolina Department of Public Instruction Exceptional Children's Division every year at the annual EC conference um, honors one of the teachers of each of the districts that have provided leadership and service for students with IEPs. This year, um, our district has elected Arletta Bullock to represent us at the conference that's in November, November the 4th and 5th. Ms. Bullock has been with us um, for eight years, five of which have been served at Welcome Middle School. Um, last year, when I came to the district and worked um, with our Exceptional Children's Department, Ms. Bullock um, pretty much held down that school regarding students with IEPs. She had 64 students on her caseload. We had several vacancies. She um, wrote the IEP. She conducted the IEP team meetings. She held the caseload and held the team. The students continued success. Um, as a result, we were able to fill the positions, um, but she was able to make growth. Um, her students, the students with IEPs at Welcome Middle School, exceeded expected growth due to the hard work and dedication that Ms. Bullock put forth. So um, I would like Ms. Bullock to come forward just to recognize um, the efforts that she has provided for the district. Motion to approve uh, consent items. So moved. Jill uh, made the motion. Mark, sec uh, Mark seconded. Mm -hmm. uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that passed. We we'll go to new business. EPS committee update. Mark and Cheryl. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Cheryl. Um, at the last EPS uh, board committee meeting on September the 15th, we had the honor of watching Betty Miller be sworn in. That was the first order of business. And then after that, we gave a brief STEM update from the meeting that took place at Welcome Middle School uh, with faculty and parents about the uh, possibility of Welcome becoming a STEM middle school for the district. Uh, the second item of business, we, we uh, were looking at the policy revision 10.111 for student transfers. You have a copy of that document in front of you if you would open it up. At the, at the committee meeting, we got, it was, um, we were looking at the policy to begin with just to do some corrections to some wording that had been mistyped. And then we got into a discussion on what would be preferable for the transfer uh, statements. If you'll turn to page two, section D, you'll see two paragraphs. They're identical except for the last sentence. Uh, what's in red is what we wanted to strike out and then change. 
And if you see, if I read it, siblings of students in the assigned to the district exceptional children's program, siblings of students in the assigned to a district, it was just a typo that we happened to find when we are going through some policies. Where the discussion came in was at the last sentence. So we want it to be siblings of students assigned to a district exceptional children's program are allowed to transfer if they have a brother or sister in the exceptional children's program at the school to which they wish to transfer and otherwise meet the school's <coughs> academic requirements. Now this is where it's different. They may continue to attend that school as long as their sibling is in the exceptional children's program at that school. That's paragraph one. Paragraph two, they may continue to attend that school through the exit grade of the school. So there was some discussion on which we would prefer and so we need to have a, a open the dialogue on that and have a vote on which paragraph you'd like to use. And so I, I would like to say, why did you not do sibling in both uh, sen uh, the sentence above that in which you say brother or sister? I was just wondering why don't you say if they have a sibling in as you have done I in can. that last. I can. I mean, I was just questioning that. Well, For some just, reason you wanted to do that more definitive. So I just okay. didn't change that. Yeah, I didn't know. Sure. All right. Mark, um, Ms. Stagner, this is just a first reading, so we don't need a formal vote. Is that correct? Well, it, it appears to me that the board needs to make a decision about which version Burger. is putting forward the first reading. Right. Um, so that would be that the actual <coughs> approval would be at the next meeting. So would you recommend we label, label one maybe A, one maybe B, and take a vote on yeah. either or? Any more discussion regarding uh, which letter? <coughs> A B1, paragraph B2. or B? First or the second? Charles? What is the, um, the issue with transportation for the non exceptional student after the exceptional child is no longer at the school? It would be up to the parent. It has to be provided by the parent. Mm -hmm. Do we need to make that clear here? I don't know if we need to make it clear in the policy when they okay. the rule is is if there's room on a bus on the exceptional children's bus mm -hmm. when the exceptional child is riding that bus if there's room we allow the, sibling. the, the siblings to ride if there's not room though they have to provide transportation right right from the beginning okay. so in that process of assignment is when we go through all that with the parents I don't know if it necessarily needs to be in the policy thank you Jennifer I'm prepared to make a motion to okay. accept um, B as the option. You mean to that to be the forward. second paragraph? Second paragraph. Yeah, I thought we labeled them A and, a and B, B, so I'm going with B based on what you asked her. Mr. Chairman, so I would any, second. What? I would second Ms. Little's motion on that. That sounds good. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor of B and uh, that would be the second paragraph under D. That's what we would be voting on. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, pass. Okay, I'll bring it back then. All right. And that, that was the conclusion of my meeting. Okay, finance update, Benji. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Michael, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening. Of all the areas yeah. that are changing with, um, within education today, I think the area that is seeing the most rapid change has to do with our uh, school food service program, child nutrition program. Part of that change is the required bidding of our vending program for bottled beverages. Over this uh, past summer, uh, we put together a, a leadership team comprised of school administration, uh, central office administration, as well as child nutrition uh, program employees. It's been led up by Leanne Sealman, director of the child nutrition program, to provide a bit of that vending program and to evaluate that program. And this has been something that's been worked on over the last three or four years, basically, since the last time we had a fiscal review by the Department of Public Construction of our, of our, um, our overall child nutrition program. What we have here tonight is Leanne Silman, who will come forward, uh, director of the program, to basically give you a little bit of background information about our vending and how it uh, relates to the smart stacks uh, standards, as well as um, the federal requirements for, uh, for bidding, and then give you a little bit of information of uh, the bid that was actually placed out and uh, competitively bid, 
and uh, the recommendation of the uh, of the committee. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Um, since I have come into the school system, um, it was brought to my attention that um, the vending program in Pitt County has been managed by the Child Nutrition uh, Department, I think since the early 2000s, maybe around 2002. And um, during that time, we have had a couple of competitors bringing products into the schools, and there's not been a formal contract. DPI, in uh, some of their federal monitoring in the past, did indicate that we needed to uh, do a competitive procurement for the vending that was happening in the school system. But they also advised me at that time to kind of hold on until the smart snack standards were implemented, um, that there was some sort of a rule, even though we're operating on an interim rule, to go ahead and wait for that to be in place before we went ahead with a contract for uh, vended beverages. We did have to implement the Smart Snack Standards in July of this uh, year, July 2014. So it uh, put us in a position to go ahead and begin with this procurement process. Um, what USDA wanted was a competitive process that would award the business to one vendor. And so that's what we were looking for. Uh, in our process, we were uh, paying close attention to that competitive process, making sure that it matched up with all of the uh, federal requirements and that uh, we were in compliance with also uh, any state and local um, requirements for bidding, and that we would be in alignment with the Smart Snack standards at all grade levels, and that we would continue to provide economically priced products for all of our consumers and uh, maximize product utilization and profitability for the school system. We uh, put out a request for proposals, and um, they, we actually had five different vendors come to, um, well actually we advertised and sent the bid to five different companies. We also advertised it on the internet and through the IPS. And uh, we had three people that responded to the um, initial uh, request for the RFPs and they came to our required pre-proposal meeting. Uh, after that meeting we ultimately had two vendors submit um, proposals for our consideration. Michael mentioned that we did put together an evaluation committee that consisted of several principals and uh, Michael and <coughs> myself and other people from my department who had been working with the um, vending programs. And then we also discussed um, the process with the high school principals at one of their, at their September meeting. Uh, the evaluation committee did um, have a rubric of that we looked through the criteria, and I think you may have that in front of you in a packet. It shows what the selection criteria was based on. Uh, further down in the page, it will show you the rating results for the two vendors that um, did submit bids, being Pepsi and Coca-Cola. <coughs> we um, were mainly looking at uh, the areas that were very much the same, and you see that in many of those areas, the vendors were equal in their rating. The areas that um, we saw some differences were mostly around the pricing back to the consumer and the um, commissions that were promised by the vendor. Uh, Coke had an array of different um, commissions that they were going to offer based on different products, and Pepsi was more, they gave us one commission for all different products, and uh, they were able to maintain our current pricing to students, which is something that we had uh, indicated in the proposal we would look favorably upon. So um, based on the evaluation committee and looking at the selection criteria, we would like to recommend that the board approve Minji's Bottling Company for the uh, vended beverage proposals or for the business for Pitt County. The first contract would run beginning January the 1st through December 31st of 2015, and after that first year there is an option for us to renew the existing contract for up to four additional terms. Say that again now, what you just We would award this contract initially for one year beginning January right. 1st through December 15, or December 31st, 2015, we would also have, we have an extension clause in the contract that would allow us to renew the contract for up to four additional terms if we reach agreement with the vendor and they're amenable to it. All right. Sean. Mr. Chair, I move we uh, approve using Minji Bottling, bottling Group. Second. 
Sean made a motion that we use Menji's bottling <coughs> route and Mark second. Any discussion? Uh, uh, Ms. Council. I just wanted to ask uh, nutrition. <laughs> um, why are we um, even if even approving one drink over the other or drinks that are really not healthy for our children? Um, so I have a, as, as a public health professional, I, I have problems with that. So I would like for the record to show that um, my concern is that um, we should give both companies it if who's going to give it. And, and I think the nutritional side of things, since we're dealing with our child nutrition, that uh, soda should not even be a part of, of us having to approve, I don't think. You want to speak to that? Yeah, Ms. Council, I would like to clarify that. The uh, products that will be offered in the vending machines that are student accessible would all meet these new smart snack standards. So they okay. would be bottled waters. They would be um, other waters and beverages that are low calorie. They may ha they have a certain amount of calories per the number of ounces that can be offered. And there would be some isotonic drinks like um, a low calorie Gatorade product or similar product. I'm not sure exactly what I think G2 is the Pepsi brand. But um, those beverages that will be in machines made accessible to students will have to meet these smart snack standards and they are very rigid. Uh, there would be no soft drinks available to students. Okay. But soft drinks are a part of this contract and they would be in machines that would be in the teachers lounges okay. as well as in machines that would be accessible to students and to other customers 30 minutes after the end of the official school day. That's a part of the smart snack requirement that all foods have to meet their particular nutritional um, requirements from midnight until 30 minutes after the end of the official school day. So we'll, we'll have healthy snack or healthy beverages available for students. Did so. that help clarify or you it still had, want to go on record? Clarify, but I, I you still a, want to go on record? Over, you know, go on record that I um, don't like approving one over the other because uh, even though Minge's is local, but to me that doesn't really matter. It's just that I'd I like think to, we should provide both contracts if we're going to do one or the other. And I'd like to clarify that. We okay. receive about $7 million a year in federal funding. And as part of the state's requirement to review those dollars, it was uh, established that we did not uh, actually, at the beginning of this inception of this program, actually bid it out to a sole source provider as required by the guidelines. So that was something that the state was looking for when they come back for a financial review that we would not be in jeopardy of losing any federal funding as a result of that requirement. So you have to do one yes, exactly. above yeah. it, so that's required. Okay. All right. We don't have a price. How much are we? We don't have a price on here. Um, actually, what we are um, bidding is the they will provide the uh, product to us and they will pay us a commission based on what we utilize. Uh, so there really is no bottom line bottom amount line, that you're no. looking at. We looked at some projections mm -hmm. based on uh, historical usage and what the um, commissions could look like. And based <coughs> on the um, information that we got from Pepsi, we gave them some usage figures based on last year's um, numbers of what we had bought. And uh, the commission could look something around $77,000. Okay. And uh, I will make one last point about the fact that uh, Coke did make a proposal that would generate uh, more revenue, but it came at the expense of passing price increases on to students. students. Okay. And one of our main goals here was to maximize revenue, but not, but not pass price increases on to students. Okay. And in both proposals that Coke established for us, both would have um, uh, passed that on to the students. Okay. Thank you. What is the retail right now? Uh, we have some products that retail for seventy-five cents, some a dollar twenty-five, and some a dollar. Any other depending on the size of yeah. Any other questions? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. One note, Ms. Counts. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. The uh, Human Resources Committee update, Mary and Delilah. Jackson. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Good evening, um, the Human Resources Committee met on September 23rd, and we discussed several items. The first thing was the personnel update, just giving a an overview of how the year has started. With um, we had about nine and a half vacancies at the beginning of the year. We did have a lot of resignations um, through retirements and attrition and relocation and did indicate that a lot of those positions were replaced with beginning teachers. So we are increasing our beginning teacher support. We have two additional people that are working with our beginning teachers as well. And uh, Mr. Seth Brown will be coming up after I finish my report to talk to you about the beginning teacher support plan that we have in place. But we did talk about the fact that we also have key BT teachers, which are teachers that are newly Higher teachers after four years, they're still considered kind of new, but they're also providing support to teachers that are in their first year. So you'll hear a little bit more about that plan um, in a few minutes. We also talked about the hearing process for our classified employees, and we'll be looking into that to get a little bit more detailed um, under the direction of Mr. Ken Su, so that we'll have a clearer process for our classified um, employees. So we'll be giving you more information about that once the HR committee meets um, in October. The Affordable Care Act, of course, we know that the look back period is approaching, which is October 30th. So we are still continue, continuing to monitor, but they did have some information that was released regarding our retirees that they must stay under a certain amount of hours or they would have to switch over to district supported benefits. We do not know the details of that. They are devising a plan for them at this point, but we'll have more information on that in October as well. Also, the General Assembly has discussed a differentiated play, pay plan. Some of you may have heard about that. We do have some ideas and working on that. Has to be given to the General Assembly by January 15, 2015 at this point, unless something changes in the revisions of that or they delay the process. But basically, it would be the responsibility of this board through the recommendation of the superintendent to create a differentiated pay plan based on whatever elements that this Board of Education comes up with. So that is something that we will be discussing further as well. And lastly, we're about to embark on another salary study. The last salary study was done by Pitt County Schools as far as everybody overall was in 2003. So that was 11 years ago, so it's time to revisit. We um, have had a lot of discussion in our district about teachers as far as their salary was looked at basically from the General Assembly area, we're going to be looking at supplements for teachers. We're going to be looking at all of our classified employees and other support personnel. So we will begin an outline of that process to be given to the HR committee in the October meeting. So that is our update. Any questions about the update? Okay, Sounds at this time good. I would like for Mr. Seth Brown to join me at the podium. He's going to give you an overview of the beginning teacher support plan that um, is mandated by the Department of Public Instruction. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I think everyone has in your board packet the beginning teacher support plan. Um, this is something that we need to do technically every year. Um, and it's something that over the last year, I started this job last year, and over this last year we did a lot of listening and working with our mentors, and the plan has been completely rewritten. Um, pretty much from scratch. We used plans and ideas from lots of different um, counties, um, and we really used our lead mentors. These are the individuals in the schools who have been supporting teachers. Um, up until this year, they've been supporting them as basically a volunteer uh, duty. And Dr. Jackson said it's on page 16, the plan. Uh, but they um, helped us tremendously develop this plan. Um, the plan is also on our website. We've got a, a website, the teacher support uh, website, Pitt County Schools Teacher Support website. The plan is up there as well as tons of resources that we're working with. There are six major changes in this plan. The first one has to do with the school lead mentors. This plan um, is designed, or in the, in the plan, the school lead mentors are paid for the first time in a very long time. Um, it's, it's a model similar to how we pay our EC contact, so it's not like we're just making something up. We use the model like EC contact. Uh, or the coaches, it's extracurricular compensation pay, uh, but we pay them based on the number of beginning teachers at their county. 
Uh, we have 436 beginning teachers as of last week, last time I counted. Uh, that's one, twos, and threes. And that's impossible for me and my staff of now five part-time retired ladies to handle. So we these 36 individuals are tremendous support for our beginning teachers in the county. So this is an investment from the county. It's a tremendous one that took a lot of work from Michael Cowan and Dr. Jackson to get worked out. Um, but that's a, a huge investment. The second is that each um, new BT1 will have a three-day orientation during the school year. This is something we've done every summer. But for the first time, we've got an organized orientation for our late hires. We had uh, last year around 70 new teachers hire throughout the year. This is an, out, an organized set um, program that we have for the first time. Um, so that's a new part of the plan as well. Um, we also have a more organized way to deal with training teachers in the evaluation system. It's something we've done, but now the idea is we have to document that we have trained them initially. So when they first do observations, there's that initial training we have to do. The fourth point is the key BT part. Um, this came from an idea that um, we had talking about we deal a lot of times with beginning teacher support with the ones that are struggling, but really the key investment is going to be in the ones that are flying high. The concept is if, if we're going to have a change, if we're going to do something new, um, if we get our, our high flyers, they're the ones that are going to walk down the halls, lock arms together, drag other people out of the classrooms, walking with them. And if you're really sort of hesitant, they'd probably throw you over the shoulder and walk down the hall with you. Uh, these are the innovative, creative, um, energetic teachers that we need to support. We're having our first meeting with them this Wednesday. Um, we've got five meetings scheduled throughout the year. We're going to focus on uh, teacher leadership and communication within the BT realm, not asking them to work with experienced teachers yet. They're still beginning teachers, but within those beginning teacher realm, they're going to work with training each month with beginning teachers. Again, training and protocols within that realm of beginning teachers. Um, sort of the big ambitious part of the project is I'm working with uh, the BT coordinator in Lee County, and hopefully in April, late April, we'll be able to take them to the General Assembly um, and to Hunt Library and get them in the creative studio and get interactive and problem solving with other beginning teachers, get them to the General Assembly so they can advocate. Um, and then each summer they help us induct the new people. Um, so we have a successful, innovative beginning teacher to induct our brand new ones in. So that's a huge investment program. Um, the other two are sort of quick ones. The other one is um, working with Dr. Jackson for any beginning teacher um, that coaches or works, that has a performance issue, but also coaches or does extracurricular duty. They need to go through us to make sure they do that because their first priority is to teach. Um, so we're working with high school principals on that, but that's a, a plan that met their approval and, and should be good. And then we'll also have to formally assess how we are doing. So we're going to assess ourselves biannually um, in the plan as well. So that's something that we haven't done before, but something that we need to do to assess how we are doing and work in the plan. Um, I think the last step, if you have questions or anything you need, but there's that last page. Um, need the superintendent and the board signature once you guys vote it, and then we are approved um, and ready to go. So, I got a question regarding the assessment. Are you saying that these 436 BTs are they going to have give you feedback? Yes, sir. And that hasn't happened in the in the past. So I think that's a good point. Yes, so that they, you can tell whether they're getting the support that. You're hoping that they're getting. So we're looking at beginning teachers and principals and then the lead yes, mentors. So, right. so that way we get those three demographics so we know how do we tailor our staff development, our work, whatever we're doing for the for the coming year and the future years. Yes, sir. That's good. Jim, I meant uh, Jill. Uh, with 400 and some BTs, I think it's really important that we have an aggressive, all-embracing plan. And this sounds really good, so I'd like to move we approve the beginning teacher support plan. Jill made a motion. I hear a second. Second. Ms. Owen, second. Any discussion? Mary? Okay. You said they were first time ever paid, and I understand that part, but you were saying take them to the General Assembly, to the Hunt Library. Two, two different groups. The, the lead mentors is the experienced teacher that is in charge of organizing what they do at the school level. So, for example, Eastern Elementary has a lead mentor at the school, and that's the first time we're paying those individuals, that one teacher, to organize the, the beginning teacher um, activities at the school. We're paying them similar to that we pay the EC contact. It's a stipend 
uh, but it's based on the number of beginning teachers they have at the school. And let me clarify, we, at one point in time, the state provided money to pay mentors, and that was cut out from general budgets from the General Assembly. So what Seth is talking about now is locally supported, where we're putting that, that money and investing into our teachers that are willing to mentor our beginning teachers. So that's what we're doing, because we have 436 of them. That is a fourth of our teaching population. Let me ask you about that 436. Is that, that number's going up? Um, yes, sir. It is going up. Okay, and what, what are you going to say? I'll say it's, it's right, right now, technically, where we have 460, some from last year, uh, I think 462 or so. So it's, it's right there at it, but right. the trick is we're going to have 70 coming in this year, so most of it will come, come up. Right. Mark, you have? I'm just going to say I think it's a good idea that we're paying folks in that position. A lot of the school districts can't afford to do that, and I think we need to again thank, and I know Mr. Johnson's here, a lot of that money's probably coming from local allocations. Oh, yeah. but, um, again, we're appreciative of what our county is able to pull together in terms of local money to help make this happen, because again, the state's not paying for this, and our teachers are all receiving it need to know it's coming from local money, most likely, and uh, we're grateful that we're able to make it happen, because they do need to be compensated for the extra time. Um, a lot of these folks are putting in a lot of hours helping to shape and mold our new teachers into successful teachers that will stay with us, and that's important. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, passed. Thank you Thanks. so much. Thank you so much. Matt, I'm not even going to mention my name. I'm just going to say Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get this thing working again. Okay, operations committee meeting was held on September 22nd. Um, we've had a lot of discussion, um, not only with the operations committee, but with almost every board member here about where we're going, where our needs are as far as our capital projects compared to what our county is telling us, where our growth population is going to be, where it's not going to be. Um, with that, we have the potential, and we've discussed that here in this, in, with the board uh, prior, to go and leverage $25 million, approximately $25 million worth of debt from the county um, to go towards our capital um, construction funding projects. Um, the board has voted prior to make Chicago the number one priority for the board to go after this uh, funding for. It is the number one priority set forth. Um, the uh, front section of Chicago building was built in 1929. That puts it 85 years old. Um, there are some things that definitely needs to be done in that section. Um, if you look at what we've gone through so far and have been put together and, and probably presented to you before are the three phases of Chicago, which you all have a eight, uh, 11 by 17 handout um, as well as is up on the screens. Um, are the three phases of Chicago. Um, phase one is all complete with the exception of the sewer tie-in. As soon as our, the contractors that are doing that sewer project going out that way get completed, which the new date is somewhere around um, Thanksgiving, we'll be able to finish phase one and actually tie the sewer in from the Chicago school and make that happen. Phase two would come along, it would bring in um, a new gym, a new media center, a new office area, and a new classroom section um, of approximately 12 additional classrooms. It would also make the final loop tie-in around the back to help with the traffic flow, bring a temporary bus staging area up in the front of the building. Basically, we would turn the school. So the front of the building would actually be in the back where it is now, and the, the, the front would actually become the back. Phase three would be go in and tear down the 1929 section of the building, build on another eight classroom section, tie that into the existing cafeteria, add on to the existing cafeteria, renovate, um, and remodel the cafeteria and the existing kitchen. Um, the price, um, the estimated price of phase two and three is approximately $18 million. The committee has gotten together. We've talked about all the needs across the county, where we think we need to be with the uh, ability to leverage this debt and how we need to spread it out. Um, the committee has asked me to bring to you a, a different scenario. Um, instead of taking phase two and three and completing that construction at Chicago, 
is cutting out phase three, saving us approximately eight million dollars, and only focusing on phase two construction project at Chicago. Um, the estimated cost of construction for phase two is ten million dollars. This would do a number of things. It would allow us to take the additional approximately fifteen million dollars that we can leverage from the county and spread it around the county for other needs that we are in dire need of across the county. Um, we are actively putting together a priority list for everything else that, that's out there um, with dollar values that we will be bringing to the committees and, and eventually to the full board. Um, it'll also save that front face, that 85-year-old building that a lot of people think is a, a historic landmark out there in the Chicago area and a lot of people don't want to see that go. So what we're really asking for the board as a whole to decide tonight is if we want to move forward with this, do we want to shift our priorities as Chicad is our still our number one priority, but shift it to just phase two construction of Chicad, continue going after our $25 million to, to leverage, create an, a, a different priority list that would allow us $15 million to go out and do other needs across the county. Now you're saying that that would leave uh, 15 million approximately to go out and do other things throughout the county yes sir which may help alleviate redistricting and so forth it has the potential if we if we help. take that money and divide it up and add um, classroom space where it's needed where we're overcrowded we go into these areas that are in dire need of of roofing and dire need of, of flooring and stuff like that that we can go put this money into as well as create additional space around the county where we're overcrowded already it could potentially save us from redistricting yes I think when we discussed it um, Matt I think we were discussed when we he talked about redistricting and things of that nature I think one of the examples that we that we spoke about was we used as an example was Lake Forest and the trailers um, with the extra monies that were left over we could potentially add on classrooms Correct. to Lake Forest instead of having permanent trailers out at Lake Forest we could add I think potential of 10 additional classrooms to Lake Forest. Um, I think with the overflow with South Central, we could do an additional eight classrooms. There's, um, there's several what you're scenarios. Planning, what you're planning. There were several scenarios that we could do yeah. that would have long-term lasting permanent effects throughout the county, and Chicago would still get its help in making it a priority and wouldn't have to spend $25 million in order to get it done. And the thing that we also have to keep in, in uh, our minds here is that we are able to use this money to go out and add things that some of these other schools desperately need. Desperately need. Desperately need. Mm -hmm. And yet, Chicago is still getting their phase two. Two that project was done. promised mm -hmm. and which eventually we will look at phase three yes regarding Chicago mm -hmm. uh, Miss Owens and so in what year is the uh, sewer project supposed to be finished <laughs> <laughs> November that's a very good question no, it, it oh, should which be, year this yeah, year it's supposed to be completed by Thanksgiving of this year of this year okay. I, I mm -hmm. know when we see it we've heard that projection we've heard that for several years yes yeah, several yeah. years yeah. Yeah. Mr. Chairman um, just two or three questions and then maybe a comment or two. Uh, first thing that I, I, I guess, Matt, I didn't like the way you used the phrase cutting out phase three. <laughs> I, I have no issue at all. I have no issue at all with a phase in a, being. Wait, wait just a minute. <laughs> with, the with a phased in approach, uh, I, I think that's smart to this extent. Uh, what the board member said about spreading the money around is fine. I, I, I know that Chicago has been a priority and a number one priority for decades. So to get phase two completed is great. The second thing I want to make sure of is that phase two will provide for the student enrollment that we need 
for the growth that is expected out there. Can you speak to that for just a second? I can. We, we will not lose any capacity by going this direction. We actually gain some capacity because you'll still be able to actually use that front section with the classrooms in there. So you will not have, we will not take away any capacity from that school. You'll still be around a thousand seat school out there. Um, the projections from ORED and what we've seen is with growth patterns in the county is we're not expecting a, a large boom out there. Um, actually, it's, it's kind of flatlined from, from what the reports are showing us as far as the attendance. I mean, you're talking about 1,100. Yeah, you could you can potentially get eleven hundred kids in this new yeah. setup. So too, because I'm not through oh, okay. yet. <laughs> All right, I'm, just, I'm going back to. You. So so I just want I just want to make make sure we're clear that everybody's listening. The the sewer is to be complete. That's important. Yeah, <laughs> it's where I live. The sewer is to be completed by Thanksgiving. Yes. Phase two. <laughs> is phase two with with a delay on phase three so that we can get some of these others yes, sir. other other schools or other things Fortress. that are important. Fortress the word, sorry. <laughs> it will provide an enrollment so that there is no such thing that we have to think about as far as redistricting is concerned. Oh me. We have the potential to take that additional money and put it in the areas where we are overcrowded right now. Correct. And 1,100 students is what phase two will provide for us as far as the size of that school is concerned. You'll be approximately 1,100 seats. I'm satisfied. Sure. Mr. Chairman. We looked at no Hold on just a minute. Hold on a minute, Mark. Matt. <laughs> Come on, Mary. I am. <laughs> All else feels bent. You can move across the river. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I mean, uh, what I would like to say is I think given uh, one of the areas I'd like to see looked at that's been talked about by a lot of people, and I think since the late 90s there have been trailers on the front lawn of Conley I would desperately like to see those moved and I know we just put those there as a kind of a stopgap measure and we replaced them with a much nicer set and from what I'm hearing the staff is very appreciative of that but I think going forward in as much as we can addressing that issue and certainly the students from Chicago feed into Conley mm -hmm. Conley is continuing to grow and I think you know, it looks like it's maybe one of the largest, if not the largest, high school in the district now. Um, that needs to be an area that, going forward, and I'm just putting it out there, I know dollars are tight and, you know, we have more pressing needs, but um, that needs to be something I hope we'll take a look at because that is a, a definite sore look, sore look for the district. It, it is definitely one of, the, um, one, of, one of the items on the priority list. Um, mm -hmm. I guess as we create this priority list and, and we get all the, the insight from everybody and the thoughts on that, on how the whole list will shake out for, for using the rest of the money and then moving forward as we continue to go, it's definitely on the list. It, we definitely have to, to look at that to make sure. Um, I, I think the goal of the board would like to be to remove mobile units from every school. Every yeah. school. Mm -hmm. is, it, I mean, eventually we can get there. And I, and I know you're aware of it. I just wanted to put it out there. And what we have to remember is once we make a decision on this, he, uh, Matt and his team going to come together and they're going to put together a priority list that will go to operations. Operations will look at it and approve something to send to the full board for us to vote on as a full board. And we can make decisions on whether we like it or not or need to send it back to him and his team to uh, prioritize again. Uh, Sean? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Matt, once again, I want to uh, publicly commend you for being such a good steward with mm -hmm. the public's trust and the public's dollars. Thank you. Uh, because the main thing that, that I've heard uh, throughout this whole process with the Operations Committee is getting the most bang for our buck here. And really what we're deciding here tonight is not necessarily um, what to spend the other monies on right here at this time, but we would be approving, in a sense, essentially, 
to have those other monies available for other projects and not just, if you will, having all our eggs in, in one basket, although the basket of Chicago is important. I, don't, I want to stress that. But this was just an, an excellent job, Thank in you. my opinion. Ms. Council. The question I have in terms of historic preservation, have you all explored from the state or the federal level any monies that could be utilized to help in the preservation and the upgrades as well? We have not gotten that deep yet because the original plan was for that section to be demolished. Mm -hmm. So if we eventually get the phase three and we're going to remove that section, um, that's one reason we haven't really looked down that avenue. But it's definitely something that we will take a look at and see if there's anything out there for us um, federally grant wise any of that kind of stuff that would help us preserve the uh, that building and and leave it there for us and actually maybe fund us to go back in there and do some restoration on it so we, we can definitely look into that so i thought it might help us as well as and again matt you said if we eventually we will get to phase three mm -hmm. When we get to phase three, yeah, yes. we'll do that. Make yeah. sure. <laughs> well, in that turn, I mean, in, in that note, in the, the the dirty word of redistricting, mm -hmm. is always wanting to be avoided. But the the fact of the matter is, I don't think it's. I'm not going to be here when those decisions are made. I, I agree with all that's been said about phase two, but I don't think that it's the smartest thing to say out there that this area will never be recon. I don't think you can avoid the possibility of it being redistricted at some point because of the growth and because of all that and would it be more prudent for this area to look at a redistricting possibility to shift some kids around versus phase three and you, i don't know that answer yet i'm just saying i think it's a little bit more i think you don't put things in concrete of what you're saying here in order to get to phase three Correct. if it's needed if there's an alternative um, solution to m maybe moving some kids that maybe have some openings in other schools. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Do you need a motion? We need a motion. I move that we um, approve doing only phase two at this point at Chicago School with the Sorry. 25 million that we will have available to us. Mark Gill made a motion. Mark second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> okay. Great job. Mayor, we got it approved. Yes, we did. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> okay, school health advisory uh, council. Student wellness policy. We've got Joe Morgan and Lynn Silman and Terry Joyner. Yeah, Joe Morgan. I'm currently a volunteer with our um, School Health Advisory Committee, which we refer to as our SHAC. Prior to last year, though, I worked for over 31 years with our Pitt County Health Department and served on our SHAC during that time. I wanted um, to, to say in that vein of what a wonderful partner Pitt County Schools has been in the area of health. Um, we've been recognized across the state, the school system has, with regard to our health initiatives. Um, and we continue to have a great partnership, um, some of which we'll talk about tonight. So the Healthy Active Children policy actually required or, let me see, the establishment of a shack. Um, but I do want to point out we've had a, and this was in 2003, but we've had a shack or school health advisory council since the 90s when it was a good idea, but it wasn't a requirement. Again, I think um, pointing out Pitt County Schools' uh, progress towards addressing the health of not only our students but our staff as well. Um, I th there are eight components of a school health um, program and they're listed here, I'm not sure how well you can see, but physical education, health education, health services, 
nutrition services, a healthy school environment, which is really talking about um, safe schools, family community involvement, counseling, psychological and social services, and also health promotion for staff or, or wellness for staff. I think we all can agree that healthy students learn better. I think we also can agree that it's not just the school system's responsibility to ensure the health of students. I used to say in my other job that I just don't think that the first time a child was introduced to a chicken nugget or a french fry was probably in kindergarten. I'm just guessing, I don't have any data, but I'm just guessing that those are things that families have to own as well, how we have, um, how we, the, the role that we play in helping to um, teach our children. It's a, it's a tremendous issue in our families that we have to look at. And so our schools are willing to partner with our families and our community resources to help address some of these needs. And it takes that village, if you will, again, um, with our health and medical community, which we're very fortunate in this community to have such a strong um, community of, of folks to be willing to help us. So when we talk about a school health advisory committee, again, there were two primary roles. One is to advise and the other is to um, coordinate, which is a huge role. There were eight components that we just talked about. And so we bring in folks that um, represent both our students and parents, uh, child nutrition, physical education, school health professionals, board of education representatives are certainly invited to participate with us, school administrators, the public, and our medical providers. The, the requirements are that your shack has representatives from eight of those coordinated uh, programs, a member of your uh, person from your local health department, and then school administration. And so again, these meetings, um, are, we can, uh, Lisa Tate with the school system is um, the person that is our conduit to our Board of Education and to our other um, administrative staff. And so if anyone's interested in serving on our shack from this board, we'd love to have you. Or if anybody's listening and would like to be more involved with our shack, we'd love to have you. Because there are eight coordinated areas, we didn't want to go over all eight of those with you tonight. We'd love the opportunity to come back throughout the school year, perhaps, and talk about some of the other areas. We want to focus on two this evening. One is our child nutrition uh, program, which you touched a little bit in, in a previous presentation about um, some of what we're going to talk about there. And then our school health program, which fondly is often referred to as our school nurses. And so um, at this time, I'd like to um, ask Leanne Seelman to talk about our child nutrition. Um, in the Healthy Active Children's Policy, this is the policy that refers to how we look at nutrition and also activity. This is the one, I don't know if you've heard about, the 150 minutes of physical activity for elementary students. Two, this is part 225 for middle. This is part of the Healthy Active Children's Policy, and there's a nutrition component as well. And so tonight we'll focus on the nutrition, and then we'll also have Terry Joyner with us to talk about our school nurse program. Thanks, Joe. To talk a little bit about the uh, child nutrition program's role in student wellness, um, you know, our, our objective is to help students understand and have an opportunity to practice some concepts that will lead them to uh, make better health decisions down the road, to develop some very good healthy uh, lifestyle, um, dis to make some healthy lifestyle decisions. And hopefully that will help them uh, with disease prevention down the road. We've got some things in place actually I think I'm a little ahead of myself, to um, enhance what's being taught in the classrooms. We've got a Taste Explorers program that has been going on I think since the late 90s. It's an opportunity for students in elementary schools that want to participate to um, be exposed to different fruits and vegetables that they may not otherwise have an opportunity to sample. Then um, we also offer that same um, fruit or vegetable to the entire school population through menus. We've developed uh, Eat Smart Move More bulletin boards. They are an opportunity for us to do just a little bit of nutrition education when the students come into the cafeteria because there's not a lot of time for us to do one-on-one um, -on -one in the cafeteria, but we still want to be considered a learning laboratory. We want for students to see good examples of what should be offered um, for meals and give them a lot of options of fresh fruits and vegetables, canned fruits and vegetables, foods that are baked instead of fried, and uh, some whole grain foods that they may not typically see in their home. We put some um, nutrition education materials in media centers. Growing Up Fit is a, a media or something that's available in media centers as well as Food for Thought. 
We um, try to inform our parents and our students through uh, a newsletter that is published every month, and it also includes our menu for the month. And we also have uh, fresh fruit and vegetable grants at two of our elementary schools this year at Belvoir and at Northwest. Through that grant program, those students are uh, given a snack three days a week that's either a fresh fruit or a fresh vegetable, and they get a nutrition lesson along with that. And we think that that is one way that we can impact nutrition education and the healthy living skills that students will need to develop. Uh, another part of our program is to offer all students access to our program, and we want to um, offer affordable access. We have not had to go up on meal prices since the 12-13 school year. The paid lunch equity um, that is required by the federal government kind of tells us when we're going to have to go up on food prices, but we've been able to um, operate a program that has been able to let us keep those prices the same for the last couple of years. Um, we've also implemented the community eligibility provision at six of our elementary schools that allows all students in those schools to have breakfast and lunch every day at no charge. And we're hoping that that is a, an opportunity for us to eliminate the barrier of um, having to have money to eat a school meal. We've been doing some breakfast expansion. Uh, last year we had several schools that were doing grab-and-go breakfast. We've had uh, We've got five now that are interested in doing that, and more schools are coming on board. Part of that is because there's more of an interest in breakfast. There's a higher participation rate, and we just simply can't get kids seated and into the classroom in time, so we're doing some grab-and-go. They can take their breakfast back to the classroom, and uh, breakfast in the classroom is considered part of instructional time, so they're not losing any of their instructional time. We've also, um, again this year, ran a very... Um, big summer feeding program. We had 18 sites within Pitt County. You see that we've done over 18,000 breakfasts and 59,000 lunches in about 40 days over the course of the summer and uh, reached out to a lot of students in our community. We also run after school snack programs throughout the school system uh, at several of our elementary schools. And then another thing that we have to do to uh, make sure that our operations are always maintained is to continually train our staff. We've had opportunities to do that um, this year with uh, preparation for our administrative review that's coming up so we've looked at all the different aspects of our program and we are going to be doing some additional training throughout the year to help our folks be well informed about food safety about the requirements of the program and everything that our students need to um, or what we need to do to provide a meal for our healthy students there are we're also responsible for uh, working with the nutrition guidelines for all foods that are available on campuses and uh, we were talking about that a little bit earlier with the smart snacks um, we of course plan all of our meals and snacks to meet the federal requirements and this year the uh, federal government implemented the smart snack standards and that does address all foods that are sold to students from midnight until 30 minutes after the end of the official day um, the smart snack standards establish, establish limits on portion sizes, the nutritional content of foods and beverages, and that includes calories, fat, sodium, and sugar. So we are really very keenly aware of um, what is going into our menu, what is actually going into the foods that um, make up our menu, and the nutritional values that students are able to consume if they do take part in our meals. Um, as far as having access for all students to our programs. One thing I did want to mention is we do um, special diets for students that have medically necessitated um, needs. And even if those students aren't um, diagnosed with a disability, we try our best to um, meet the require or meet the um, accommodations that parents and physicians may ask for. And currently we're uh, operating with about 530 diet orders in the school system. We have one RD that is managing all of those, but it's um, quite a large task. But uh, that's something that we also do in, um, I guess, cooperation mm -hmm. with our, nur our nurses. And so I'll turn it over to Terry Joyner and tell her, let her tell a little bit about the school health portion. Thanks. Well, I'm excited to be here tonight to get to talk to you guys about our school health program. Um, I think that in a lot of ways, we're one of the most misunderstood programs out there. A lot of people don't know what the school nurses do. Um, so I'm excited to get to come and talk to you guys tonight about what it is that our nurses are actually doing. Um, I've got a bunch of data for you tonight, which I hope you'll find interesting. Um, there are 20 school nurses here in Pitt County Schools, and we cover everywhere, pre-K pre all the way up, transition center, the whole gamut. We're covering everybody now. 
So 20 nurses and 37 sites, obviously that's not a nurse on each campus every day. Um, most of our nurses have two schools and, and their assignments are based on what the acuity is in the schools. You know, we have students that have G-tube feedings and um, very intense health needs at school. Um, some of those um, nurses have got lesser numbers because the acuity of, of the student needs are a little bit higher. So, um, but they're spread out throughout the county. Right now, currently our ratio is one nurse to every 1,250 students. Um, national and state recommendations are one nurse to every 750 well students. And those are students that don't require medicine, that don't require procedures. Um, you know, so we're still quite a ways away from that one to every 750, but we're working towards it. We, um, we were threatened by the budget this summer that we might lose a few nurses and we managed to keep them. So we're excited about that. Um, one of the things about our program that's interesting is that we're, we're all employed through Vident. Vident um, made a, a very strong commitment to Pitt County Schools many years ago. The program started in 1996. Um, with just a couple of nurses and has expanded. Um, so we now have the 20 nurses plus me, the manager. Um, 13 of those positions plus my own is, are funded directly through Vident. Vident funds all of that. Um, two of them are funded through Pitt County Schools, which we really appreciate, and five of them are actually state funded. And that funding goes from the state through our health department, the Pitt County Health Department, to Vident so that we provide those positions um, to Pitt County Schools. We have a phenomenal, you know, we were talking about stakeholders and partnerships. Um, we have a phenomenal working relationship between Vident and the school system and the health department. It takes all three of those to really work well together to make sure that we can address the health needs of our students in our schools. Um, so we really appreciate those partnerships. Um, always trying to get more positions in there. Um, I think it's interesting and I love seeing partners public parents for public schools. <laughs> um, Charlotte Mecklenburg actually had a parent group that pushed and they actually are going to this year by March have a nurse in every school in Charlotte Mecklenburg, all 161 of their schools. Um, because, and I'll talk a little bit more about why, why you know, I just want to put that bug in your ear. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people think of the school nurse and they think of this nice little health room and the little nurse with her little outfit on and that she's taking temperatures and putting washcloths on kids' foreheads and giving them a little Tylenol and um, patting them on the head and sending them back to class or catching their vomit when they throw up and, you know, sending them <laughs> home. Um, and to be very honest with you, that's not what our nurses are doing. Our needs in the schools these days are very different from that old-fashioned school nurse and her little outfit and her bucket. Um, we have got about 20% of our students have got chronic health conditions. And some of them, they're big chronic health conditions, you know, asthma, you know, <clears throat> asthma is a tough one, you know, it's one of the biggest ones we see. Diabetes, our students with diabetes have to have their glucose checked in school and insulin given at lunchtime. Um, and, our, as, you know, we already talked about, there's not a nurse on campus every day, so who are doing those procedures? We're teaching our staff to do those procedures. Hey, Ms. Miller. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> she was one of my teachers when I was at Wild Coast. Um, so, you know, we're teaching staff to do that. Staff are administering medications. Um, we, you know, I alluded to G-tube feedings. We have lots of students. We have regular education students that get G-tube feedings. You know, it was a NICU baby that has short gut and needs that extra umph to make it during the day. I taught a teacher at Wild Coast how to sit there at lunch and do a G-tube feed, a tube that goes right into the baby's belly or into the student's belly. So we're teaching those procedures to staff. Um, and that number, 20%, that continues to go up. You know, we're very fortunate here in Pitt County that we have Vident Medical Center. It also draws families that have kids with needs because they can get those <coughs> needs met here in our county. So we have lots of kids with health needs in our county. Um, and we oversee all the medication administration. That's a, a task that here in North Carolina we're very fortunate we can delegate that. In many states you can't delegate any kind of administration or procedures. Here we can. Um, and we do, and you'll see on the screen, we have 300, this is data from last year, we had 325 routine daily medicines that are being given in the school. Um, teachers, secretaries are being taught to do that and administering those meds with the school nurse as their support. Um, 1,510 emergency medicines. So that's mostly your students with asthma that need albuterol should they have an asthma attack at school. Um, I think a lot of people saw with Rose High School the, the pepper spray incident last week and lots of students with asthma had trouble. Fortunately, that nurse was right there on campus. She triaged those students. They sent nine to the emergency room on ambulance um, and that was handled very, very, very well, I think, by our nurse. Um, 
And then we have, last year we had 330 other as needed medicines. So that's your Tylenol, your ibuprofen, those kinds of things. Um, and we don't have those standing orders for our students. You know, a lot of people think they can go to the school nurse and get a Tylenol when they have a headache. And, and we don't, we don't do standing orders. We, we do require doctor's orders to be able to have those things. Um, so that's just a little bit about what's going on. Um, just wanted to give you some, some really good data from last year so that you know sort of what these 20 nurses are out there doing in the county. Um, they fielded 11,163 referrals. Most of those are on students, but I'll tell you they're also on staff. You know, we take care of our staff that have high blood pressure. We take care of our staff that have mental health issues. We're doing lots of things for staff as well as students. Um, those referrals were on 7,487. That's a third of our population right there. I mean, I think it's just pretty impressive how much our nurses are doing. Um, and, and they documented 27,000 encounters. That's like 27,000 visits into the doctor's office. That's huge. That is so much need out there. Um, and, I, and I think they're doing a phenomenal job with it. One of the things that we do with our students that have health care issues is we write health care plans. And those are plans so that the teacher understands that student with sickle cell that's in their class and what does it mean that his eyes are yellow and what does it mean that you can't put ice on his boo-boo when he falls on the on the playground and what does it mean when he comes to you complaining of pain you know if he has a fever how do you handle that compared to your regular students we write a very thorough care plan so that that teacher and the staff are aware of what they need to know so that that student can be in class and be learning safely um, and then we do the education based on all those plans so they do different kinds of plans. The IHPs are those big plans that tell them all the things that they need to know about. EAPs are emergency action plans, and those are the ones like for a student that has seizure disorder. If you see your student fall to the ground and have jerking movements, this is what you need to do. And these are the contact numbers, and this is when you need to call 911 so that the staff immediately know what to do before, any, you know, before the first responder gets there or the nurse gets there. Um, and then allergy or asthma action plans are the AAPs for our students with asthma. And then we also have a lot of, it's like 300 severe allergy action plans. And those are our students that have EpiPens in schools. Um, our nurses also participated in 286 504 plans. One of the things that I preach all the time is what schools really need their nurses doing are those, those heads up things. Not so much the hands on, putting a band aid on, but the heads up, sitting in a 504 meeting with a child that has you know, MS or, um, um, you know, sickle cell. And what does that student need to be able to be successful in school? Because what we want is any barriers to health to be eliminated so that those students can learn in class and, and gain to the best of their ability. Um, vision screening is another huge one. Obviously, if kids can't see, it's really hard to, to learn when you can't read the board. So we do mass vision screenings on first, third, fifth, and seventh grade. Um, and we, at, last year I was real proud, 76% of the students that got referred out for vision care because they failed those vision screens actually got to the eye doctor and got glasses. That's huge, that's higher than the state average um, and we're making great strides there. Um, so we're real proud of the vision, vision outcomes that we have. We also train all of our first responders. For, we're required by law to have two first responders in every school building and here in Pitt County, I would dare say, I don't think we have a school with less than four, we try really hard to have plenty of first responders so that if there is an emergency, that there's somebody readily available to help that student or staff person. Um, and then we also did a lot of health education presentations. We do hand washing with kindergartners and first grades. I'm sure everybody's heard about the old enterovirus that's out there right now. Um, we're working really hard trying to make sure people are washing their hands and disinfecting and, um, and know not to wipe their nose and then touch their friend, you know, those kinds of things. So we do a lot of health education. Um, in the high schools, we do groups with our pregnant and parenting students. Um, we do health fairs, all sorts of other great things that are going on. So the nurses are out there, they're busy, they're working hard. We certainly would love to have a nurse in every school. Um, and we'll just, we'll keep puttering away at that one and hope that we, that we can get there. So I don't know if there's any questions about school health. I just spit out a whole lot of information at you very quickly. Um, but we'd be happy to, to field any questions that any you guys questions might have. questions or comments? I was just curious, Mr. Chairman, Mr. more of a funding issue, I guess, than anything else because, you know, you said that we need a, a nurse for every seven, recommended that we have one for every yes, 750, which is good. And we really do appreciate everything that y'all do. You're very, you're valuable 
Thank to the school system. But with Vida putting in part of the resources, are y'all Vida employees or Pitt County Schools employees? We are all Vida employees. Everybody, even the ones that we mm -hmm. contribute to, mm -hmm. we just flow through money towards right, Vida. Right. Okay. okay. Back when, when we added those positions, it just felt like it made more sense for it to be a, a congruent group that, that all kind of went the same way. I think so too, and I was, I was a little curious about that. We're actually very lucky that we're Vida employees because we have lots of resources that we, if we were school system employees, right. that we might not have access to that we do have through Vida. Biden's super supportive and we have lots of access. May I follow up, Mr. Chair? Are you, are, are you familiar with the other counties and if they are school, but more of them more school employees versus hospital employees? They are. Actually only 3% of school nurses are hired by, school, by hospitals. Most of them are either health department okay. employees or school system employees. So this is unique, special? It is very unusual. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. It's national stand, national statistic, 3%. We're fortunate. Yes, yeah. we are. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Oh, it's a mirror. I just want to say I thank them too for coming and being a formal public health professional. This is really important to me to see the thank students you. and get good health care. And also, we need to add a social worker onto the schools too. Nice. All right. <laughs> we, we love have our more social problems. workers. <laughs> it would be nice. <laughs> social worker and nurses are a great team. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Just one other comment. Um, so what we'd like to do, again, at another board meeting is to maybe discuss a couple of, a couple of the other coordinated um, uh, elements of a coordinated school health program so we can kind of just give you a little bit of information along. Literally thousands of dollars have been brought in through this coordinated school health approach to support these initiatives that we're talking about talked about some of them today, but, but literally thousands. I haven't put that number together. Um, it would be interesting to because we've been working on this for a really long time in this school system. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Karen, if you would just look at getting that on the on agenda. All right, comments by the superintendent. Uh, just quickly, I'd like to thank um, uh, Cheryl Longstead and the whole curriculum team for organizing our strategic planning that we had last week. Had three nights, uh, had several board members, Ms. Camus, Ms. Miller, Ms. Owens came every night, I believe. Mr. Forbes well, came a couple nights, and Ms. Uh, Williams and Ms. Council each came a night. So we had a lot of representation um, from the community members as well. Um, and uh, yeah, Mr. Miller, Mr. Uh, Moore came for a, for a night as well. So the boy took off to see his family. But, um, got a lot of nice feedback from the community. Um, Ms. D. Marston from the Boys and Girls Club. Did a, did a good job keeping us organized, keeping us on track, um, getting the information from the community members and from uh, the staff, and keep, keeping it flowing. It was very nice. Good week. Thank you. Mr. P. Yes. Uh, getting back to the school nursing, I was on the board when we, and uh, Dr. Cameron's was on the board when we get, we first started this program, and I, we thought then it was an excellent program. And, of course, you know, when we first started, we started with a small number, and we were hoping to increase, but, you know, everybody's fundings have gone sour. But uh, I remember when we first started it. Jim? Um, I would like to urge everyone to take advantage of the offer that we heard tonight to spend a day at South Central High School in November. Um, I think every one of us that did it last year thought it was a great experience. Um, maybe not everyone around the table. Mark, you probably don't need to do that. But <laughs> you learn a lot about the reality of high school today, and I, I, I would like to just urge everybody to take advantage of it. They are offering five days, so got to be able to get there. And um, I agree with Dr. Lenker, the, the uh, strategic planning meetings were very, um, came, we came out, out of those meetings with a lot of really good thinking on paper that is going to, I think, be worked by the uh, EPS committee. But whether or not those three evenings are worth it is going to depend on this board and what it does with the mission and the values and the things that we talked about those <coughs> nights and whether or not those truly become um, roadmaps for the future of this school system. And I hope that they will be taken seriously um, by the next board, because I'm sure it's not going to get to this one. But um, I hope you all can make that effort worthwhile. Mayor. Um, 
I like to thank everybody for, and I, I, I don't know, everyone wasn't in here earlier prior to the board meeting, but I'd like to thank everyone for all the cards, the texts, the flowers, the food that came by during my surgery. Um, my voice is proof of that. <laughs> um, I'm healthier and feeling much better than I have been in a long time, and I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, I also had an opportunity to attend the strategic planning session one day, and then we had county business to take care of with the um, election, um, Pitt County election president. So then we had to go to a conference in Greensboro concerning the uh, black elected officials, which was an excellent conference. It was held on the campus of North Carolina a and which I am gratefully a member. And this is like my fourth or fifth year attending. I've been attending since Michael Dixon and Bishop Love um, were on the board, and it discussed um, Brown versus Board of Education over the past 60 years from there to now. Um, and it was just awesome um, between North Carolina A&T and Bennett College. And we had the president of North Carolina Superintendents Association, you know, just board discussions throughout the state. and. They discussed everything for child advocacy. Um, everyone was there from Judge Marsha Fudge to Kay Hagan to um, Alma Adams, you name it. They were there, Dr. Forrest Toms. They discussed everything pertaining to the state of North Carolina and education as it was pertaining to teachers, where you stand, um, where your, where our children stand in the future. So, um, uh, one second, one second. Wait, one second, Mr. Chairman. But it was just um, gratifying just to be there this weekend, and it was just an awesome, awesome thing. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, just a comment about the South Central experience last year, and um, not all, it was it was very um, insightful for me. But also the other day, I was um, this is a year later. And I was shopping at a local grocery store, and this person tapped me on the back, and she was like, are you that lady that was the school board member that was in our class last year at South Central? <laughs> she graduated, and I actually had bought some of her artwork because I was in an art class. And I followed up after the our visit and the day, and I, I was really interested in her artwork that now sits in my de uh, on my desk. But anyway, we re reunited because of that experience, and she is now at Pitt Community College and pursuing art. So you will get a lot out of it, not only from a very learning experience, but with the re relationship with the kids, and that was really, really important. So anyway, I hope you'll take advantage of it. It was really fun. I would just like to say that I feel very honored to be sitting here tonight with you, and um, I want to say thank you to all of the staff members who have answered my emails with lots of questions. I've learned a lot in the last two weeks with um, the committee meetings and the strategic planning, and it's just real exciting to see things from a different perspective of, thing, of how things are um, going on in the county for our kids, and uh, just thank you. Thank, thank you for being patient with me. <laughs> Uh, I just want to say thank you to our educators across Pitt County Schools from uh, the custodians to the bus drivers to our teachers to principals to central office staff. Our public schools in North Carolina are performing better than they ever have. Uh, and if you don't believe it, take a look at the test results. Uh, most recently, North Carolina posted some of the strongest results that they have in a long time. Specifically, take a look at what charter schools are doing. Some of our students in Pitt County are attending uh, charter schools in other areas. Uh, Northeast Carolina Prep is one in particular. Be sure to take a look at the test performance out of those charter schools. I think you'll find that even some of our lowest performing public schools are soundly beating the charter schools in terms of their performance. And that's an important thing for parents to have to take note of in terms of decisions that you take that impact the quality of education that your students receive. I think you'll find that public schools are some of the best places for students to be in terms of traditional public schools for your students to uh, receive one of the best quality educations that you'll find. 
I didn't go up top. No, you didn't. He didn't start it over. <laughs> oh, good. So that <laughs> was good. <laughs> so, uh, but thank you to our teachers for the great jobs that you're doing and the wonderful benefit you provide for our students. So, at the strategic meeting, I don't, don't know if it were which one. Anyway, I was asked how many school nurses there are in Pitt County schools. So now, I'll know the next, next time. time. <laughs> I, I want to say hats off to you. I think that's incredible. And hats off to Cheryl because she was sort of the moderator in every group that I was in, and you opened many doors. Thank you. And I'm going to have to use my watch. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I just want to uh, yeah. continue to <laughs> thank uh, our superintendent and staff for a tremendous job. One, one of the things that I think that uh, we uh, have been passionate about as a Board of Education is to remember that our, mm -hmm. our students and parents and community is are our customers and uh, maybe in the past uh, in some circumstances we have not uh, esteemed them as such as much as we do now and there is a tremendous priority on that response time for concerns that teachers have or parents have has been tremendous and I do appreciate that and with a with a school system of 23,000 students almost 24,000 students I think the last count I saw I mean you you have a, you have a staff that's concerned they respond they respond in great time and you have a, a, a superintendent also and I can give example after example on that but it's it's it's, it's, it's pleasing to me, and I appreciate all the efforts that we do on behalf of these kids and our parents. And I didn't go over two minutes. No, that's a miracle. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Council. I too like to echo Miss Williams' uh, comments about the North Carolina uh, State uh, Board of Black Association of School Board Members. It was excellent, and the highlights for me was that. Um, they gave us information on what's happening with our higher education institutions too and how that's going to impact on the, the school system. So they took it all the way back from the 1600s up to today, letting us know that some of the things we experience is nothing new. So we need to be aware of that and need to work hard to get those votes out and get people that support public education and all of that in office in no October and November through early and the voting on um, in November. Also, Shaw University Cape Center here in Greenville is doing a open house this Thursday, 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. And if you're interested in attending, this is for the non-traditional student, 439-5339, uh, from 10.30 a.m. in the morning to 7.30 p.m. at night. You can call and let them know you're coming. Refreshments will be served. And it's a great campus, and we're all trying to continue to educate everybody. But our General Assembly is really causing problems with our current students in the UNC schools. We got some real serious information this past weekend that, uh, which is going to impact on us about the students that are A students. If you don't do uh, 1,000 on the SAT or 17 on the ACT that you, you may not get in school and, and over 1,000 students was impacted just this fall of 2014. So we really need to know that our current Change General that. Senate members are causing some real problems for students to even go to college, even if you may be an A student. And the last thing, the Candidates Forum for Pitt County in the north side of Pitt County would be October the 20th. 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. at the Holly Hill Family Life Center in Belvoir. We have invited all candidates statewide to participate. It's 80 some candidates, so of all parties. So come out and learn about them and, and so to see how they're supporting public education and education in general. Thank you. Thank you. Sean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Council, when you said uh, refreshments will be served, will, will those be Pepsi or Coke products? Well, we can see that's a surprise. <laughs> it should be both. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> I'm expecting both. I <laughs> will be there. You know I have to ask. Mr. Chair, I move we adjourn. Second. <laughs> Eight, all in favor? Aye. opposed? I love that.